And most of them came from where? The East Coast. I mentioned the international slave trade two days ago. People were brought from Africa to the transatlantic slave trade. And then in 1807, the Congress outlawed the importation of Africans or enslaved people from wherever, even from the Caribbean to the border forbidden. No more importation of enslaved people. They have to be born here. But it didn't mean the end of slavery. That's 1807. And the law uh, was applied from uh, January 1st, 1808. Uh, but before that, we had two very important events. One in 1803 when uh, Napoleon, who took the colony back from the Spanish, you know, the French, lost to the colony of Louisiana after the, after the Seven Year War, 1756-1763, which was some kind of a world war, mostly uh, with two countries and their allies, the French and the British. Ne dites rien aux enfants, non, papa, madame, je ne peux pas couvrir ma voix. Ici, c'est la place des enfants. Expression libre. So, uh, from 1763 to 1803, this was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Spanish colony. The king of France, Louis XV, decided to pass the colony to his uh, cousin, Charles, Charles II who had the means to protect Louisiana. Uh, the King of France didn't want to lose it all to the British. The British almost, uh, took uh, almost all the east bank of the Mississippi River, the Illinois country. So, in 1803, when uh, Napoleon was really in power and uh, very powerful, he decided to even conquer Spain, you know. And uh, he decided to take it back from uh, the Spanish. But he did not keep it. He sold it to Thomas Jefferson, acting as the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, Napoleon was fighting everywhere, and he needed money, and especially to fight against the rebels in Haiti. He started rebelling in 1791, and uh, who eventually defeated his troops and proclaimed the Free Republic of Haiti in, in 1804. Napoleon did not keep it because he knew also that the Americans would take it anyway. It was in the agenda of Thomas Jefferson to have the control of the whole subcontinent from, the, from coast to coast. And Thomas Jefferson, in his Manifest Destiny Doctrina, clearly made it clear that any country that occupies the Mississippi River and the city of New Orleans is a natural enemy of the United States. Louisiana is sold $15 million. Uh, most of the money may be wasted in Haiti. Haiti became the first modern black independent republic. And many people fled from Haiti. The, those French people, planners and the enslaved people, frankly also prefer people of color. It is estimated that more than 5,000 enslaved people came over here and also more than 3,200 free people of color came over here with the knowledge of making sugar. The first sugar maker of Louisiana, his name was Antoine Morin, and he was hired by uh, <coughs> uh, H.M. de Bore, who was the first to produce uh, sugar at an industrial level in Louisiana. His plantation was uh, somewhere in what they call the Garden District, district of town New Orleans, uh, where University was, uh, was built. Okay. So this is the 19th century. And uh, let's go back to the abolition or the, uh, the, the pro, I mean, uh, the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. When uh, they decided to, uh, to, to terminate that uh, trade, it did not really stop people being deported from Africa because some people. Uh, became smugglers. It became a huge business. And the most celebrated person in Louisiana 
was a great uh, slave smuggler. His name was Jean Lafitte. Yeah. There is a big park, national park here, that carries his name and many other places. But anyway, the east coast of the United States, which had uh, a surplus of uh, enslaved people, became the provider of uh, uh, enslaved people to the deep south. So after the, the, the Louisiana Apache, we had what they, what they call the great migration from the East Coast to the Mississippi River, toward the Mississippi River, new land. Uh, almost un, unlimited compared to the impoverished lands of the East Coast. People migrated with the enslaved people. And also slave traders found a big opportunity to buy enslaved people from the East Coast, like uh, uh, Maryland, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, Carolina during the summer. And then during the fall, they walk those people, put them on the road and walk them from the East Coast to here. Can you imagine walking from Baltimore, Maryland to New Orleans, mm -hmm. the main destination and the first uh, slave market in the, uh, in the New South, the Deep South. Six to eight weeks, shackled. Someone called it the Trail of Tears. Some people were transported from uh, like Charleston on boats, <coughs> but most of them were walked from the East Coast to here. And whenever you see East Coast, that means the, uh, the person came from, from there. I did not see East Coast on the, on the archive, but I just decided to have that uh, generic name. <coughs> that, but they would say, Negre de Virginie, Negre de Maryland, we Negre de, de Kentucky. Huh? And I just decided mm -hmm. to have this one uh, origin East Coast. <coughs> This lady here from, was from the East Coast, Anna. Anna Wilson. She remembered sometime when she was like four or five years old, around 18, um, maybe 10 or, or 15, the slave traders coming on the plantation in Virginia, and they took her, her mother, and two brothers, put them on a boat, bound to New Orleans. The mother died on the way to New Orleans, and the body ended somewhere in the waters. Once in New Orleans, she was separated, sold from her brothers. She never saw them again. She landed here on this plantation. She was bought by Marceline Heidel who was the co-owner of this plantation from 1820 to 1840 uh, with uh, his older brother, Jean-Jacques Heidel, Jr. And she became a companion slave for, for his wife, Marie Azalee Heidel, the last Heidel to own this plantation from 1840 to 1860. <coughs> in 1835, she gave birth to Victor Heidel, a mulatto who was the father, Antoine Heidel, the brother of Marie Azri Heidel, the last owner of this plantation, Victor Heidel, 1835. Two years before, Victor Celeste was born here, Celeste Beckner. She was the daughter of uh, uh, Florestan Becknell, who lived on the next plantation, we call it Evergreen today, it was a Heidel plantation, the plantation of Christopher Heidel. And then when Christoph died, his daughter Magdalene married a Bucknell, it became a Bucknell plantation. It was just like the same family owners, owning like five adjoining plantations. <coughs> and Florestan Bucknell was the father of Celeste Bucknell, born here in uh, uh, 1833. And uh, Floresa was the brother-in-law of Marie Azalee Heidel, the last owner of this plantation. Floresa Beckner was the husband of Josephine Heidel, the sister of Marie Azalee Heidel. You see, the owner of this plantation, her brother and her brother-in-law, having, you know, affairs with these, uh, uh, with these, uh, with these ladies, 
If you grow up on a plantation like this, you are a, a girl, you grow up to the age of poverty, you are in big trouble because you don't own your body, you don't own yourself. You are subjected to abuse. It was far more difficult for ladies than for children. This was hell for ladies, you know. You were subjected to abuse. One last thing, among many others I could address today, and I, would, I just want to add one thing here. If you have good ears, I uh, mean eyes, you can help me. This was the auction of, uh, <coughs> this is the last plaque we put here.